part of what's interesting about veganism in particular, more than any other diet, veganism is highly steeped in politics. Yeah. I know this from being vegan for so long, right? Like even when I say being vegan, I'm not saying eating vegan, I'm saying being vegan, right? Like it becomes your life and it's not about animals. It goes into social justice. It goes into racism. It goes into colonization. It goes into so many little corners of the world or the, around justice that then if you stop being vegan, you are suddenly all those things now. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mujica a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. So oh, today I'm joined by my team and I'm going to be exploring a recent experience I had where for, actually, for the last few years I've been uh, slowly unbecoming vegan. Is that how you'd say it? Uh, <laughs> you know, moving, <laughs> moving out of veganism, which was a big part of my life and my identity for a long time. And it, it's really through this work that it took me out of that lifestyle, which I'll get into in a moment. And when I started uh, exploring outside of it, it was very private and very personal. It was also really scary because I had so many people in my life who <clears throat> I was bound to through this shared identity that really loved me for this. And to suddenly not be part of that, I knew there'd be some some ruptures. So I, I hid it for a while. And then I stopped hiding it in person with people. And then I realized I wanted to make a post about it. And I'm always, always surprised which posts of mine are controversial. Like I'm never ready for it, truly. It, most of the time when I think it's going to be controversial, no one even notices it. And then the times I think it's the simplest thing in the world, hundreds of people notice it and they, get, they have a problem with it. So uh, this post was really, really controversial and very popular. It had several hundred comments in the first day. And uh, a lot of the comments at first were really crude comments uh, over coupling me with, you know, being a very violent person in many different ways. And then what followed were these comments that were like so loving and so tender and so connective. You know, people with a lot of humility saying, oh my gosh, this is my story. Thank you so much for sharing this. I needed to hear this or so happy you followed your body. And so I thought it'd be fun to play with it here uh, because what this is teaching me and what it, why I felt ready to speak about it on a social media platform is I, I no longer want to belong to any group. I, I mean, I never want to belong to a group, really, but I never want to belong to a group where I'm not allowed to change mm -hmm. and where I'm not allowed to ask questions or be curious or disagree. And if I disagree or ask questions or get curious, I'm somehow banished from the group. That That's not the kind of community I want to belong to. So it, it really helped me learn how ready I am, you know, for losing people and spaces and even stories people have about me um, just by being what's honest in me in that moment. Uh, so I thought we could dive into it. So where should, where should we begin? Camille's going to help me dive into this a little bit and then we're going to bring the whole team in. Oh, so let's start with just explaining what, what prompted you? the unbecoming of, of veganism? I would say what really started it for me was um, 10 years ago. Oh, I 10 years ago? Yeah, 10 years ago, exactly almost. I was diagnosed with Lyme's. So I live up in upstate New York and I had this tick bite on my ankle, which was really red. And I didn't really know much about ticks or limes because I was fairly new to the area. People talked about it, but I wasn't really an expert in it. And I started getting these really intense neurological issues. Um, my eyesight got really bad. I got really uh, intense light sensitivity. My short-term memory was just gone. I would lose my thoughts all the time. I had this weird pain in my spine with a fever for a couple of days. I could get out of bed. I could barely move. Uh, I was given MRIs, all, all these things. And then it, it turned out that I had Lyme for about a year um, that went neurological really quickly. And so I remember then I was reading this book by this German man, Wolf Storl is his name. And he cured his Lyme disease by going to the tropics, taking herbs, eating all vegetables and having fish once a day. 
And I remember thinking like, oh, we had fish once day. It's so interesting. And I understood as a nutritionist, like how fish was so good for the nervous system. Uh, and my body at the time was like, you need some fish. And I remember getting like one piece or two pieces of salmon and eating it. And it just so happened that this salmon I got was contaminated with E. coli. And so I got really sick for a year straight. I couldn't digest anything. And it took me a while to, to, to heal that with herbs. And I finally did. But so in my mind, I'm like, I went off the wagon once and I got hurt. Like, it's all true. I never want to eat meat again. Never going to do this again. And then a few years ago, especially the deeper I got into somatic work, this was before somatics, and the deeper I got into the work of Byron Katie and just kind of questioning my beliefs, I started asking myself when these symptoms started coming back after COVID, because COVID can like reignite symptoms of Lyme and other neurological things. My symptoms all started to, to emerge and I had this six month long COVID, kind of like post COVID experience. Uh, I was following this guy on Instagram. Uh, the name is Georgie's Gardens. And he's this nutritionist in the Pacific Northwest. He's near you, actually, Marika. And he's such like a sweet looking man. And he has these images of his plate that he, like whatever he's eating with food each day. And it's just like usually eggs and some kind of fish and like big chunks of local raw cheese. And I'm looking at these and I'm like salivating. And I never had that before, you know, usually I'd look at that and be turned off. And so I thought I'm going to go to the store and get some Beyond Burgers and some <clears throat> Vio Life cheese and like all, all these things are going to mimic this experience. Oh, excuse me. And so I got that. And so I got the Beyond Burgers, started eating them every day and I was fine. I was like, I'm good. Like it, it hit that emotional craving. Yet my body, and this is what I was learning as I was eating it, my body wasn't tricked. Like my body knew it wasn't getting what it was craving, which was actually local eggs and fish. It was like, that's what it was really craving. And so that's when I started thinking, I'm going to try some local eggs first. And I did. And in two or three days, my neurological issues started to disappear completely. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try some local fish. And I did. And full body recovery, like in four or five days. And at mm -hmm. the same time, it was interesting. I was working with my Akutu, who's like the abuela for the Tainas. And she, her name's um, Irka Mateo, Irka Mateo. And she was saying to me, Luis, when you go to Puerto Rico, I want you to have the sweet fish from the river and the salty fish from the sea so you can balance your masculine and feminine energies. And she had no idea that I was even craving fish. I didn't tell her. She didn't even know I was vegan. But she's like, I want you to go eat these. And so I thought, okay, that's interesting. I'm doing ancestral work and that's coming up. My body's wanting fish and eggs. I started eating fish and eggs. Everything's recovering. And that's when I, I kind of gave it up. I said, I, I had this kind of moment, which is really beautiful looking back on it, where I realized this body is an animal. And what really propelled me into veganism was, you know, in, in addition to health was I wanted to be good to animals. Mm. And then after doing this work, you know, with people, I realized these animal bodies know much more than our human minds. And I thought this animal body wants to eat local fish and eggs. Do I dominate this animal, you know, through the story of, I want to be ethical and liberate animals, or do I liberate this animal? And somehow that's even more ethical than I could have imagined. So I'll mm -hmm. pause there, but that, that's, that's really how it unfurled. I, I really appreciate that context because um, but it, what really stands out to me is the noticing that being a vegan was really central to your identity for, for a long time. I'm a vegan. This means I'm good to animals. And mm -hmm. how even for, for your body, there was that resistance because of the attachment to well, if I'm vegan, I'm good to animals. If I'm not vegan, that means I'm not good to animals. And so how they're yeah. even in your body, there was that, that, that bracing, that, that uh, resistance to, to the listening because of the overcoupled belief, because of the attachment. Because even now, like even as, as you've been transitioning into, you know, e eating uh, local, local eggs, local fish, like I don't hear you describe yourself as a pescatarian or an ovo. A uh, vegetarian versus describing uh, historically, maybe describing yourself as a vegan, and so for me, even just witnessing you, I'm, I'm, I'm 
witnessing a shift in your terminology. Like it's, I, I'm not witnessing an identification with the way that you're eating mm. right now. I really love that reflection. That, that's how it feels. I think, mm. I think twice I've said a pescatarian when I was out to eat, when someone was asking because they wanted to know what I could or couldn't eat. So there was yeah. like, you know, there was like a relational reason to say it, mm -hmm. but I haven't once been like, I'm pescatarian now. I yes. feel like I've lost all identity, which is so yeah. lovely right around food. Love that. I love that. Oh, um, well, yeah, I'll pause there. Let me check in with everyone else to see if anything's coming up for you all around this. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I had a, a very similar experience as well. Um, definitely not um, nearly as long term uh, as Luis, but I went through a period of eating vegan and um, not just and I don't know how common this is, um, but not just eating vegan, but really taking on the identification of being a vegan. Um, and yeah, I think I, I became also really, really steeped in it and understandably so. I mean, the my intention to be doing something really positive was really what was driving me. But at the same time, the overcoupling was getting in the way of how I was doing. And I mean, this is a trend for me for a really long time of putting the ideal of how I should be in the world or how I should show up to other people over my own health and how I was doing. Um, and this definitely carried through with veganism where I also had a resurgence of some health issues that had been gone for a long time. Um, and yeah, it, it was really hard for me to transition away from, I think not only because um, when I started incorporating other foods back into my diet, I also very quickly had a lot of my symptoms go away. I was having a lot of eczema and um, I had lost a ton of weight. And I think part of it too, I kept having this story come up that I just wasn't a good enough vegan. Mm. And, you know, no, I couldn't. And, and there's like all the stories, like I, I can't cook well enough to maintain this. I like, and everything was always coming back as a negative reflection on myself. And like, what's wrong with me that I can't do this right. Um, and eventually I just, I just reached a point that I kind of had to release that story in order to start feeling better. I'm, I'm glad you said that part uh, about the, the good vegan, <clears throat> because I was a really good vegan. Like there could be a, <laughs> there could be a better fucking vegan. <laughs> I was like a whole food, you know, vegan nutritionist. So when I was studying nutrition, I was studying it through a vegan lens. I was learning everything else too, because I wanted to serve everybody. But I was really studying it through a vegan lens. And a lot of the negative comments and DMs I received from the post were um, like, how dare you sacrifice lives for cravings? Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about that statement, it was, it was a pretty popular statement that I was getting. It was interesting that they were seeing this as cravings truly as almost like just pleasure, almost yeah. like gluttonous pleasure. Whereas my understanding as nutritionists of cravings is, is a body necessity. There's like an essential mineral or nutrient or something missing from your body and the craving emerges from there. And that, that includes cravings for cookies even. Mm -hmm. So there can be things that, you know, cravings that take you to something, let's say processed that could hurt your body. And there's still, as we know, emotional and uh, nutritional needs that are being met from the craving. What was interesting was this was not an emotional craving I was having. That's why I went to the Beyond Burgers. Over the years, I've had those and I would go get a vegan pizza and I'd be fine. So I, I know very well from like, well, almost 20 years of this practice, that's what it feels like when it's an emotional craving. I eat the thing, I feel better. This was such a visceral somatic craving that people who don't study nutrition deeply on, on both lenses of the animal nutri uh, nutrients and proteins and the plants ones, I don't think they really have the awareness to understand their criticism of me because there's, there's such specific um, complexities around an individual's ability, an individual's body's ability to transfer plant nutrients into usable human nutrients. Iron is one of them. Vitamin C is another one. Uh, B12 is not actually the one most people think it's usually B12. It's not. It's the complete proteins. And I think for a while when I feel into my body, it was able to transfer those really, really easily. DHA, great example. DHA is the essential fatty acid for mm -hmm. your eyes and your brain, your nervous system. So you can eat flax seeds, which are plant omegas, and your body has to then, through an enzymatic process, 
uh, turn that into DHA and EPA. Some bodies can do that. There's no way to actually test your efficacy level. You just have to you know, feel if it's happening or not. And some bodies can't. And hormonally and over time, your body can't, sometimes can't process that plant omega-3 into an EPA or DHA. I think that's what I was going through because eggs and fish are one of the best sources of EPA and DHA from the plant world, I mean, the animal world. So the moment I ate those, it was like plugged right into my brain. It felt like a plug. It felt like my brain was a sponge. It was just soaking these fats up that it was deprived from. So it was beyond, Luis, there are supplements for that. How dare you kill an animal? It was beyond that. I tried all those things. And, and when you were speaking, I was realizing part of what's interesting about veganism in particular, more than any other diet, veganism is highly steeped in politics. Yeah. I know this from being vegan for so long, right? Like even when I say being vegan, I'm not saying eating vegan, I'm saying being vegan, right? Like it becomes your life and it's not about animals. It goes into social justice. It goes into racism. It goes into colonization. It goes into so many little corners of the world or the, around justice that then if you stop being vegan, you are suddenly all those things now. Somehow you're racist. Somehow you're oppressive. Somehow you're violent. It, it goes so quickly into those categories. And I think that's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. I love how you brought that up because as I was listening to you, it actually feel, it felt really similar to me, um, some of my experiences with religion and spirituality mm -hmm. and claiming claiming a title. So like right now I'm at a point in my life where I do claim the title of being Muslim. I also say, you know, Jesus is one of my teachers. Buddha is, is one of my teachers. And I have reasons I can share with people why I don't necessarily identify as a Buddhist, why I don't identify as a Christian, why I don't, it, there was a time where I identified as pluralist and there was a reason why I chose to identify as Muslim. And I'm also really aware of the fact there could come a point in my life where I then choose to identify as something else. And that could piss off a lot of people. What? You're not, because it pissed off a lot of people when I started to identify as Muslim <clears throat> for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And it could piss off a lot, a lot of people if I stop identifying as Muslim or as I be, if I begin to identify as something else. Um, because, and we've had this conversation in some other places, that idea, and you talked about it a little bit here, like these titles serve us until they don't. Like, it's, it's a nice little shorthand. Like I can tell the, the waitress, like, yep, I'm a pescatarian. Can you, okay, good. We, we kind of know what we're talking about. But in the reality of the day-to-day, -day, there's really so much nuance. Um, but we don't always have capacity for, for that nuance. We, I need a box because I can fit you in that box. And then if you're out of that box, like you were saying, oh, now I know you're racist. Now I know you're oppressive. Now I know you're, you're all these things. But everything you shared with us just now is so much more nuanced than that. It is, there's so much, so much more uh, that goes into that decision of your noticing of, 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 of your body. And do we really have the capacity to sit with someone to share with us why they're transitioning? what this means for them, what motivated them, what have they been experiencing, um, what's come to their, their awareness. Um, yeah, that, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Well, what you just said there was important to me, that curiosity, you know, why is this happening for you? Rather than you shouldn't do this or what's wrong with you, or I'm going to tell you what this means now. And it was interesting, like I said, the first, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know, a hundred comments, it felt like, the first, and it felt like it might not have been a hundred. It felt like it was, but the first list of of comments were people deciding who I was now. Yeah, you know, they had this like sudden story about me now based on this without any deep questioning, and I could really, I could feel because I've been that person, so I could feel that state when you're so frenzied and you're so disappointed that the story you had about someone is now gone. You know, like the story they told about me is now no longer there for them. Yeah. So this, right, this safety, this love, this thing they've, they've generated themselves. I never gave them, but they generated themselves has now been challenged. Yeah. They lost a person. <laughs> Someone mm -hmm. died to them. Yeah. And, and that fascinated me that there, there wasn't as much focus on how one person wrote, like, I'm so heartbroken. I remember seeing those lines I think that's so interesting like at least they're talking about themselves mm -hmm. but so many people were talking about what i did wrong and how i need to kind of change this or just the word unfollowing yes <laughs> unfollowing camp and it's like wow you can't listen to trauma wisdom because i eat 
fish it like the two separate things so i thought it was fascinating as well to see the the capacity for difference that we all talk about so much mm -hmm. can you separate this thing from this person and still gain the wisdom even if you don't like the person anymore yeah. some people couldn't or you don't agree with what they're doing or what they're really doing agree. doesn't doesn't serve you um i will say though and you may not even for this. This isn't the first time I've witnessed a rupture from your eating habits with, with students. Um, long before you and I yeah, tell me. started interacting directly, this is when I was in the course and we were talking about the quiet diet. And I don't know, you, you were talking, you had said something um, and someone raised their hand, asked a question, said, but I thought you were macrobiotic. And you just go, no, no, I'm not doing that anymore. And you kept it moving. But I could tell from this student, like they were hurt. They had a rupture. But wait, like, like you said, this, they had created the story. And I, so my mm. question for you is like, particularly as a teacher, like when you say like, oh, this is how I'm doing something. And someone gloms onto that either because it means something about you or they say, well, you're doing that. Now I'm going to do that too. But then you switch and now there's a rupture for them because they thought they were doing the quote unquote right thing because that's mm. what you were doing. Mm. What has that been like for you, maybe even before this? more most recent one i love that i, I remember that i, I I'm glad you <laughs> felt that you, you brought that in um i'm sure marika could tell you some stories over the years too where i've destroyed someone's idea of me and my, <laughs> my reputation simultaneously with them uh it, it's interesting because i think what what i'm what i'm personally going through in my life professionally and, and personally is not being responsible for people and for being in private practice for so long, there's, uh, for me at least, I felt so steeped in responsibility for each individual in my care. They felt like my children and I felt so beholden to them. And so there was this stress of having to kind of be perfect for them and to not fuck up for them and to be a really great example for them. Um, even though what I, what I, really teach more than anything is there's never a right way like the, the best way for me is the unshaming way where you're simply not holding yourself to a standard and hating yourself for it so to embody that publicly is getting more exciting and more easy because what i teach like let's say the quiet diet you know what, what i teach in week two with with students none of that information changes because i eat fish and, and eggs right now like no, it's all exactly. exactly intact right so i might not be like the vegan that you trusted because i'm vegan teaching the quiet diet i'm someone who now has you know unfolded from veganism and i'm healthier than i've been since i discovered the quiet diet and that was what was so fascinating is my my labs came back and my doctor's like, Luis, in all the years I've tested you, your liver is the best, most functioning it's ever been in your life. And I have an I had I had an impaired liver from Accutane growing up, this you know, acne medication yeah. I was on. So I had liver levels that were always really, really uh, high. And my liver was always inflamed. They're like, your liver's fine. I'm like, damn. You know, and so they were saying your blood sugar is the best it's ever been. Your inflammation levels are the best they've ever been. You've actually gone down in metabolic age. Like all these things changed in my blood. So that's why it was beyond emotional craving. But that to me is like, oh, I'm being the student of my own work. And I think the my favorite teachers are the ones that are perpetual students of their own curiosity, right? Not just like, I got stuck in this way and I'm going to do this for 40 years. And prove. No, I like to be really flexible. And I think teaching that is more exciting than being strict. So well, that's how I was experiencing you, <laughs> experience you in this, this moment. I was enjoying the fact that you weren't stuck, quote unquote, stuck doing macrobiotics just because that was something that you had been doing and you were sticking to, you know, sticking to your guns. I loved witnessing a teacher, someone I was, I was, I was potentially looking to as a mentor, really embody and demonstrate something that you were saying that really resonated with me is not, we're not exploring, you know, who you are, but where you are. And so to watch mm -hmm. you do that yourself, that really lit me up to see someone really embodying, this isn't who I am, but it is where I am. And I can be curious about where I will be next. That's what uh, it, it really brought me in, continued to bring me into mm -hmm. to HLN. I love that. Cause I, I think, I, you know, I'm someone that truly believes in God, like the true essence of God, not the religious God, but like God, goddess, spirit, universe. Mm -hmm. Like I truly believe in it to my core. It's like I feel it even more than I believe in it. So I just can't buy the idea that we know what we're doing. 
Mm. You know, I, just, I can't. And so it's like, if my body feels good, I know that the hand of God is pushing me towards something. It's just like, and not good, like dopamine high, good, like good, like centered, easy. I feel peaceful and safe. And every time I fry up two eggs and serve it on a plate of beans and broccoli, I feel that feeling. I feel this like mm, goodness yeah. in my spirit. And I'm like, I can't deny that that's happening. I mean, the, as you were talking, the word that just, there's a level of humility in that, mm -hmm. in that openness, that curiosity. Like you said, I, I can't believe I know everything. I, you know, like I'm the end all be all. Can I humble myself to be open to something else coming to my awareness and then continue to, to pivot and go for the, for, from there? Absolutely. I'm glad you said the humility piece because that, that's what this whole process has been for me. It's like my pride before would have literally made me ill, would have destroyed my thyroid and my brain to stay vegan. Mm. But this practice of humility of I'm, I'm an animal and, and I'm very connected to my own death, which I also think changes how I experience this too. Like, I don't think I deserve to live more than something else. I'm just kind of like, we're in this together. I could get squashed tomorrow. I don't know. So this idea of, you know, eating flesh of something that was once alive, it's, it's so cyclical and relational for me that it's not out of dominance. I think I'm like better. It's just out of, this is where the animal body is being moved. And that's super, super humbling, you know, to, to, to proclaim you're never going to eat meat again. And then find yourself eating fish and you're thriving. You know how humbling that is? And I don't say this as if everyone needs to eat fish. Like I'm very clear that there are people that have been vegan since they're 20 and they die that way and they're fine. That, that's, this isn't for them. They don't have to listen to it. I think all the people that got mad at me, there's a part of them that, that wants it or they mm. wouldn't have gotten mad. Whereas I had people write me that are vegan like, you know, I get it. I love this. I love that you're following your body. I'm following my body and it still wants to be vegan. I'm like, Awesome. Good. Well, that's a secure person, right? Hey, my friends, I created a space that is affordable, accessible, and anyone is allowed to join anytime. And it's called the library membership. The library membership is an online private platform that hosts dozens of my webinars, my somatic practices, private mini lectures, and movement practices. There's also a monthly sound healing and you'll be invited to a weekly Tuesday live mini practice with me and other participants. You'll also be invited to be a live audience member in our monthly HLN team podcast recordings, where you'll take place in the Q&A that happens off air after the episode is filmed. For more information on this membership, click on the link below or go to holisticlifenavigation.com and click on membership and then library. You can join right now and you can cancel or pause your subscription at any time. I look forward to seeing you in there. Well, and, and, and when I think of someone responding that way, you know, we t um, oftentimes in the course, people will ask us like, should I do X or should I, should I do Y? And we talk about how it's not about the right or wrong answer. It's about noticing what is the underlying sensation motivating the behavior? You know, I like to use right. the framework. Am I doing this out of a place of love or am I doing this out of a place of fear? Like, am I, like you said, am I forcing myself to eat vegan because of pride? Because like, what are people going to say? Or I'm a bad person, like all mm -hmm. these, these things versus am I doing this out of love? Because I love how my body feels when I eat, when I eat vegan, like I feel really settled right now. So I, and, and when we're doing something out of fear versus doing something out of love, we're going to respond to people who are doing things differently from us in a very different way like you said they're right. maybe they they are continuing to eat vegan out of pride or out of fear or some they're realizing something may not be right and now they're seeing someone else make that shift and there's that oh who are you to be making the shift when i'm forcing myself to continue to eat to eat this way when mm -hmm. i'm not settled in it when i'm not doing it this is out of a place of love but i'm doing it out, out of out of a place of fear um well yeah. you got that when you left the corporate world Yes. You got people projecting their money fear on you and like, well, I'm not allowed to do that. So you're not allowed to do that. Oh, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Like, who are you? Well, yeah, it's a similar yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are you? Who are, Why aren't who are you freaked like, out about you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, right. that's right. You should be as enraged as I am. You I should think be that's as what, enraged as I am. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what interests me. There's It's such a codependent enmeshment that just because you believe it and just because it hurts you that I don't, that I'm supposed to backtrack to make you feel better. 
And I think this is what I'm really getting at with years and years of practicing and teaching so many people how to not fawn. It's just going deeper and deeper in my own cells of how it's not even at this point that I don't want to fawn is it feels so bad to like it physically hurts. It's like most people listening to this don't have to think like I'm not going to put my hand on the, the burning stove. No one has to like work on that. And if they do, it's a very, very small amount of people in the world. Most are like it hurts. Don't want that. That's how fawning feels now. And if it, I can feel the constriction when I'm pulling a part of myself in because I fear you won't like me. But I think that the beauty of it is, I, I think I told you this, Camille, what I noticed when a lot of people got upset with me around not being vegan and unfollowed me, uh, it wasn't as many people got upset about the, the male privilege, which that may that could be our next episode we talk about. <laughs> that, lit, that, that lit up my little world <laughs> quite a bit, but, um, but it, was, it was pretty close. Uh, but when they, when they got upset, I was feeling to my body, I'm like, what's the part of me that um, is getting triggered? You know, if, if there's, because what was amazing with this was it happened after I did this work, I forget why. So let me, let me backtrack. About a week or two before I put this post out, remember I was telling you about, uh, I was noticing my overcoupling around being misunderstood. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I felt like I'm finally at a place where I'm okay being disliked. Like I can be disliked. Like it doesn't bother me now to be disliked, which is amazing. Never thought I'd be there. Being misunderstood was another level that I haven't really played with. And I was like, what is that about? And I sat with it and did the practices. And it took me to the memories when I was growing breasts. Because when you would see me with like, you know, a, three t-shirts, a vest, a sweater, you would never think there were breasts under there. You think, oh, there's like a boy. And then you'd have to go to, I have to go to swimming class or I'd have to go to the gym or, you know, something where I took my, my shirt off and I took it off and suddenly there's breasts and all the harassing and bullying and hatred that came from that. So there was this real like visceral tension around being misunderstood. Like you see me as this one thing, but I'm really this. And I realized how that was still living in my spine, like in my chest, in my posture, whenever someone online misunderstood me. And I think it was like a month or so ago, you know, I told all of you about this in detail, but someone I really respected and admired and felt close to had a sudden trigger with me. And I felt highly misunderstood by this individual. And I was like, I don't care that they dislike me. That's actually not what's bothering me. It's the misunderstood because it was over coupled with being harmed and harassed and bullied. Mm -hmm. And once I did some uncoupling with it and realized oh, this person is free to misunderstand me. Like, who am I to think they should understand? I should understand me, not them. It felt so okay. And then the post with the veganism came out. So many people didn't understand me. And I felt, I can't tell you how peaceful I felt reading those comments. And I'm not just saying that for clout. Like, I felt so at ease. I think I, I, think I read 30 comments, put it down, looked the next morning, it said 450 comments. I didn't even look again. I didn't hmm. even care. Now that is huge for me because yeah. I would have wanted to go in there and put all those out and figure out what people didn't even care. I was like, I love my life. I love my friends. I love my plans. I love my team. They can think whatever they think about me. And that it just felt so freeing, but I had to do that uncoupling around harm and misunderstood or I would have felt harmed. I would have had to like fawn and make people like me and put out dozens of follow-up posts about what I meant. And, and I just like, I don't really care about it right now. Mm. This is for me, it just always goes back to that conversation about being canceled or, or the fear of being canceled. Mm, and I, I feel like this is a really good, I know it's triggered some people, but this is a great <laughs> illustration of why for me, I perceive it as being a myth. Like, yep, there are probably some people who canceled Luis Mojica because he is no longer vegan. And it's just like you said, I still got my team. I still got my family, my house, like all of these things are true. And there are still people who want to work with me. And like you said, they get, to, they get to misunderstand me. They get to unfollow me. And realizing that the body wasn't just responding to that event. It was that, that past event as well. And taking the time to, to be with both. I love that. I love that. That's it. <laughs> it's interesting you said that because I'm, I'm I'm almost wondering if that's why I'm feeling like I want to break from Instagram. It's almost like I graduated because <laughs> like, Instagram is it's been such a school, an academy for me. Like I went in, I'm like I hate this. I like went out, went in, I hate this. Went out, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this. 
every day for 90 days, no matter how much I hate it. And then my followers just kept growing and growing. And I was just, I said that three years ago, I think three and a half yeah. years ago, I've been posting every day. And I, it's really taught me how to move through public harassment, you know, mm -hmm. like public hatred, like public love, even that's a big one to move through being praised all the time. I mean, you can really lose your center just as much as you can lose your center being hated. So it, it's been really fun to be neutral, whether it's praise or hate, and just mm -hmm. be like, I'm not really here for the comments. I'm here for sharing what's alive for me and seeing who it connects to. And it's brought me to such beautiful places. And for now, it kind of feels like, hmm, I tasted that medicine. I, I want a new medicine. I want to, I mean, again, just going back to the idea, it's not who I am, but where I am. And so, you know, it would have been, uh, and I did this for a while. I'm not on Instagram. Like, if that's your identity, <laughs> then it keeps you from potentially exploring that as an avenue for, for exploration, for connection. And then if you identify with, I post every day, then you're committing to doing that into per perpetuity versus can I notice when I've received the medicine of, of this space or even as you've done over the last couple of years, sort of ebbing and flowing between when am I on, when am, when, when am I off? Um, but I will say, just because I got to go on my tangent about Instagram, it is difficult, <laughs> as, you, <laughs> as you've experienced, to, to really address or allow for nuance. In, in that space. It's just not the sort of platform it's meant for. So when you talk about things like like privilege or uh, why your eating habits may be transitioned, it sort of allows or, or, or encourages that, fuck you, you're out of here, or I love you sort of uh, response, not really a sitting and an exchange and exploration of what's prompting it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, I, and I, everything you say about canceling be a myth, uh, being a myth, I can't, I can't agree more. It's, it's, it, it's so I watch people. I love to watch people, especially really controversial people. I love to watch them navigate the attempt of being canceled. Mm -hmm. Even if I don't agree with the thing they're saying, I can respect their flexibility because everyone listening to this can think of someone that, that triggers them and they don't like in the world. And that's fine. But imagine actually being that person, like imagine actually waking up to millions of people hating you around the world. That is not an easy job. And when I see people just navigate it, like they don't, they don't, uh, they don't fawn to it. They don't change their shape. They just remain true to who they are. They are some of my greatest teachers. And I, again, especially the ones who oppose everything I believe in even. I, they taught me how to be uh, honest, uh, regardless of the cost. And I love watching people just kind of float that and then not be too concerned. Like I remember RuPaul, I think it was like 2020 or 2021, did a, I think he put out like a tweet that was like, it was something like, while well, y'all are in the pandemic, I'm out here fracking on my farm. And there was this expose that found out like he was fracking, <laughs> making all this money. He sold, like he sold parts of his land to the fracking industry. And it was amazing how much hatred he was receiving. And he didn't give a fuck. He didn't respond to it. He didn't hold a press conference. He didn't apologize. He he said what he said. And I think what's interesting was I, I sat with him. I was like, I could find as much as I dislike fracking, I could find, I could play with the parts of me that loved it. I'm like, oh, well, that's one source that we don't have to go to the Middle East and dominate people to get. That's one way we get it locally without having to hurt another culture. And just that one thing was like, a part of my heart can be open to what this man's doing, whether I agree with it or not. And I just mm. think, again, I'm just saying it's fascinating when you have the curiosity, you can kind of understand why someone could do something. Even if you don't understand it, I love watching someone publicly deal with rupture. It's profound. Let's, let, let's, let's play with that public rupture a, a bit more. Marika, I'm curious, what are other things <laughs> Luis has done over the years, particularly surprising <laughs> things that probably caused ruptures that we, we couldn't imagine? I'll start with one, when you cut your hair. I think some people were absolutely hurt when you cut your hair, Luis. When I cut my hair? <laughs> yes. I don't know when Marika cut her hair. <laughs> probably both. Yeah. Speak on it, Marika. Yeah. I mean, it was funny because I got like heartbroken emails from people and I had one gal ask how long it would take to grow back. <laughs> like, well, I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I don't, I don't follow his hair schedule, so I don't know. 
but um, you yeah, should. Was, yeah, <laughs> you should. I know exactly put that on my list of things to do but um i would say the closest thing to me are the instagram posts there were some mm-hmm. in the be- beginning um that i would either see scheduled or you know, say like <laughs> what do you think about this and it's an immediate no <laughs> immediate no she's and actually because- stopped me getting canceled Oh, oh yeah. Like- uh, oh my gosh. I know I'm like I he's he's definitely going to get canceled. It w- and it wasn't because of um it wasn't really even the ideas. It was the way it was phrased. It was mm-hmm. me knowing because you hadn't really been on Instagram very much before. I was like you will be excoriated. Like we're <laughs> you know, like no one's going to hear the actual message. That's kind of how we would reframe it. Um and and still, I will get messages from people like my friends who follow you or mutuals that will be like, they'll demand to know what it is that you really meant by this one post oh, yeah. or something. Yeah. And I'm like, ask him. Like, I don't, <laughs> I didn't post it, you know. So it's it's been a really interesting, um, there's sort of journey to that because, yeah, I think we all kind of joked that we thought you'd be canceled by now, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. the, the, I think the male privilege one was high on my list. Very high. On yeah. My list of the ones that I was. That like, was the biggest <laughs> rupture we've had because there was, I think it was 800 people unfollowed in like one day, but then like 10,000 followed. After yeah. That. Exactly. So it's interesting, right? Like you get the, I think with cancellation, what's interesting and, and rupture is like the initial thing that happens is everyone leaves. And the people who leave are the ones who don't have capacity for change or something that's triggering. But then all these people flood in because they respect the integrity of the individual who's not phoning them. So if people can just kind of ride the wave of the rupture, you find that then you attract even more amazing people you could never even imagine attracting to your life. But it's that initial. But I, I, I want to uh, r- like go on what you're saying to her, Camille, because how did you have a, a, a very tender spot? rupture like that's been a big practice for you of of working with that how do you hold the rupture in your body you see me go through like does it affect you does it not affect you it's from marika oh it affects me yeah sorry i was like it can't affect camille oh it's me (laughs) (laughs) she won't allow that but yeah i um yeah definitely (laughs) i think because i have the same thing about being misunderstood um, mm-hmm. or, and being mm-hmm. and someone interpreting what it is that I, I mean or what I say or what I stand for. And so I get really hypervigilant. You know, that's my thing. Of yeah. Wanting yeah. to jump in front of you to be like, no, 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 he didn't. He actually, what he means is, you know, and I do yeah. like that you, you still, what I like is you will take that into consideration and maybe you will reword something so that it lands better, but you're not changing your opinion. You're not changing like what it is that you're trying to to speak on or teach. It's really just sometimes just a little bit of a language tweak will make mm-hmm. it so that more people will, will get to learn. And I just, and knowing how easily it is to be, to have like an inflamed, you know, uh, like post go mm-hmm. viral, for the wrong reasons, um, that was that's the thing that I always wanted to kind of try to avoid if we could. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, it does. It does. I would get very now I don't as much, but I would get really anxious when it was nice. just the two of us because I'm like, wait, <laughs> like you know, because I would get what I would do. People <laughs> would send me your posts, like people that I know, mm-hmm. like this white guy saying this thing with the what's up with the dots and like how the turban a turban like you know what i mean <laughs> so I, I would just get like a lot of people where i'm like yeah. you don't you don't know him like that there's, yeah, there's you know. those questions and stuff like that there's there's stories uh why you are why you present the way that you do and mm-hmm. um and i think that people are just easily it's too easy to judge like very quickly mm-hmm. based on our overcouplings and our own experiences in life of what what your dots mean to me, what your haircut means yeah. to me, what your opinion about other men and privilege mean to me, right? So you're, you're absolutely right. I remember a couple of years ago, I had a minor rupture on online because there was um there was a poster that went out for a webinar I was doing 
And in the poster, I had my dots, of course, and I had long hair still. And, and like the, I often wore my hair in the way where like the back was down and the top was in like a top knot, which I guess lo it looks very similar. It's a Shiva that looks like that, right? Oh, okay, <laughs> Shiva, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so this uh, woman from India uh, DM me, or actually like commented, like you know, how dare you? You're appropriating. You're looking like my gods. You're white. This is horrible. And then had like a huge mob of people she like sent my uh, profile to them and they were all sharing me and their stories they were calling me an asshole they were making fun of uh, my face like they were being like actually bullying me and i think there were seven or eight of them that were commenting then dozens of them sharing because you know whenever someone shares you and their stories you get a little blip that you've been shared in the stories so i was seeing all these stories of me and i sent her uh, a voice memo you know on instagram and I said, I understand you have this story about me and it's really upsetting you. I just, you know, once you know, and I said a little bit about my background, not a lot, because I don't like to wave my flag too much. You know, mm -hmm. you can get in like a, you can get in a, a, a habit of that, which I don't think is good. Um, but I said a little bit, and I was like, I'm not, you know, there's more to me than you see. And, um, and honestly, I was shocked she didn't come for the turban because to me, no one owns a bun on the head. Like anyone can put their hair in a top knot. And so I, I was, you know, I was like, you know, it's not my fault. My nose is shaped like this. My eyes look like this. My hair is curly like this. Like this is just how I was born. I, I didn't really tweak anything here. I'm just kind of wearing my hair up. But I remember feeling at first really scared. And then I'm like, it's okay. I'm going to keep being, I'm not going to wipe my dots. I'm not going to get rid of my hairstyle. I'm going to just be me. And then that exact cohort a week later, someone joined the cohort and they, in our course, and she was from India, in India. So this other person who was upset was an American whose parents were from India, this woman in India. And she writes me, I signed up for the course because you remind me of Shiva and I feel <laughs> safe and it makes me want to learn from you. <laughs> I was like, right there it is, everybody. Like right there it is. Like for one person, I'm safe for them. I remind yeah. them of their culture and their deities. And person, they're pissed because I remind them of their culture and their damned deities. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> damned if you do, damned if you don't. And I'm like, this is why you don't attune to how other people feel. You exactly. attune to your own integrity and you move from there. Yeah. I have one last question for you, L Luis. Uh, I know a couple of years, I think I'm remembering, remembering this correctly. Um, at one point you identified as a witch and then you chose to release that title. I'm just curious, did you experience rupture when you released that title as well? Or was that different for you? I didn't experience any rupture in that. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, th I think, well, I think witch has been so co-opted. Mm -hmm. um, it's been completely, I mean, talk about appropriation. Like it's been the, the term witchy has mm -hmm. just diluted what a witchy is. Someone lights a scented candle and they're witchy. I'm Little like, witchy. Bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like, like have fun. Call yourself witchy. Like we were practicing witches. Like no kidding. It was beyond scented candle. Scented candle was a curse to us. It was not witch. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But so, you know, like witchiness, I think, has so uh, it's been so pervasive in popular culture. It's become mainstream over the last decade or so. So I think there's such a dilution and it is kind of doesn't have a deep meaning anymore. It's almost like a cute thing mm. um, that when I when I took that off, there wasn't a lot of pushback <laughs> because I think it just kind of lost its charge, even for people that identified as witches before. But just like you said about religion, yeah, it's exactly what it was. It just felt like. I think with witch, it was amazing. I think I talked about this in uh, an episode with Ann Connor, mm -hmm. so people can look this look, look that up. Maybe we'll put that in the episode details of this one. Uh, that episode with Ann Connor, we talk about how we both kind of noticed, oh, witch was a term that the church came up with to use against indigenous Irish people and indigenous Europeans when they were trying to colonize. So th it was an internalized thing that happened with the colonization of the white world, you know, uh, where white indigenous people, Europeans who were indigenous were called witches and their ways were old and they were sinful and they were evil. And I realized, oh, how interesting. So witch is just like a modern like reappropriation of this term which was once something really horrible and now it's something good. Just like when I say bitch, you know, or girl, yeah. you know, it's like yeah. you kind of like you play with these terms that were slurs to make them have less of a, a charge. Oh, yeah, like my dreads. Brilliant. I love my dreads, even though my the term dreads. dreads 
pisses a lot of people off. And so I choose to right. reclaim that term. Yeah. You reclaim exactly. And so which was like a reclamation and the lineage of witches I was part of was called the reclaiming tradition. It was mm. all about reclaiming these things that you were supposed to once feel really sinful or, or, or guilty about. Um, so I'm just saying all that because I remember one day I realized, oh, which is just another way of saying indigenous. And I was feeling so connected to my indigenous Irish ancestors, indigenous Puerto Rican ancestors. I was like, I don't feel like a witch anymore. I just feel like an earth person. <laughs> it feels <laughs> that simple, you know, and so it just felt wrong to keep saying witch. Love it. Well, I know we have to start wrapping up here in, in a bit because we are going to have our continued conversation with those who, who are in the membership. But just wanted to check in to see if there are any last thoughts, feelings, anything coming up you want to share. I was just really laughing at you guys being bad vegans because I'm like, I'm the worst vegan. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a vegan, um, and I. But I was. But I did try it for like three days, and when I, like a long time ago, and I. I did, you did not, it at Menla. You did it at Menla. Didn't they have cheese there? <laughs> yeah, they did. Oh, they did. Wait, did they have cheese at Hestia? <laughs> uh, I don't remember. They had chocolate. <laughs> I ate a lot of chocolate. <laughs> but I saw you mostly vegan twice now in your adult life. That's true. I got into the seaweed snack. But the, uh, yeah, no, it's, but I did try it. I remember a few, like, a long time ago. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it really was, it, I don't, it was more of a fawning thing where I want, where I wanted to be a good, like, person. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, that's right. You know, and then I gave up being a good person because, I need to like, cheese. Fuck this good person shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, don't I was in my 20s, so yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I applaud you both for being vegans and for not being vegans. <laughs> What's well, funny, when I lived in the hostel in New York City, uh, one of my dear friends, Daniel, who's from Australia, who I just love Australians, they have such a like spiciness that I don't find in many places. And he would always say, I'm a non-practicing vegan. Because, like, he <laughs> wanted to be vegan, but he did, he respected it. He loved it. Like, he loved every single thing about it, knew everything about it, but just didn't do it. And I remember the time thinking, like, that's so weak. That's so lame. You know, what's it? But I thought it was funny, too. But now I'm like, I get it. Like, that's kind of how I am now. Like, if I could, I would love to do that. But I, my body doesn't thrive on that anymore. So I can't. So, yeah, non-practicing. Um, I'm, if I had to identify, Camille, I'm a non-practicing. I had it. I was going to say, I might have to co-op that term. I'm just non-practicing. <laughs> um, I do what I call sprints, where I go, like, uh, I'll even do raw vegan sprints because I like the way it feels in the same way. Mm. Like, I'll do fasting sprints. But, like, forever, no. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, Yeah. Well, this was a great conversation. And like I said, we will now uh, transfer over to uh, explore more with our uh, membership members. Um, and of course, if you're ever interested in having more of these conversations, please check out our uh, library membership or our HLN community membership. With that, we will say bye-bye. Bye, everybody. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.